God bless you. Thank you all for being here today, being a part of this service. And we believe God's got a good word for you. I believe that God inhabits the praises of his people. I believe that with all of my heart that he literally manifests. He shows up. He comes into the room. And he receives our worship and, and our praise. And I believe he's here to do a work in our hearts right now. Amen. So while we're in the presence of God, let's go to the word of God in the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. All of our teenagers are headed out now to youth church. So let's put our hands together for all of our teenagers. Praise God. Thank God for the future generation. Amen. 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 Praise God. Uh, we are just growing by leaps and bounds here at uh, Faith Family Church. You know, uh, just the youth ministry is growing, the children's ministry, they're growing, and um, we're constantly expanding to the left and to the right. Are you okay with growth and increase in God? Amen. 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 So the best is yet to come. We've got some exciting news at the end of the service that um, it just, you know, God is just too much. You know, he's just too much in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Well, I'm going to give a shout out to everybody watching online, to the Bibzak family all the way out on the West Coast. A friend of mine up in Canada said that he watched the uh, service last week. You know, um, how many of you all were here last week, particularly? Amen. That message, I, you know, I felt it in my heart that it was one that would be of great import to us. And it literally... Uh, hundreds of people watched it and have been watching it. Literally 654 people um, clicked on it and began to view it. And um, so if you haven't gotten hold of that, we encourage you to go back and check out last week. Uh, it really was a very important message from God uh, about his heart, about our heart, and uh, should be about your heart as well. Praise God. Well, go ahead and grab your Bible or whatever you use for your Bible, and let's get ready to go into the Word of God. Amen. Hold up that Bible and make this confession. Say it out loud. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I do what it tells me to do. And I love my Bible. So I make this as a confession. That I will meditate therein. Both day and night. On a chapter in the morning. And a chapter in the evening. And because I do. My life is blessed. It's no more a mess. Now everything I touch, everything I touch, it turns to success. If you believe that, shout hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh, your love is in excess. It overflows in our lives. We're, we're undeserving of it, but we receive it. And now, Lord, as we come into your presence, as it were, we sit at your feet to hear from you. We pray that you'll use my tongue as the pen of a ready writer to write your word upon the hearts of everyone that's connected in this service. We pray that not one of us will leave this time untouched or unchanged. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Worship me. If you would open with me once again to the book of Amos, which is our foundation for this series, Amos chapter 3 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in the book of Amos chapter 3, we want to look at just one verse, and that's verse 3. It says, can two walk together except or unless they are agreed? So whether you talk about just two people walking down the street, whether you talk about a couple in a marriage, or with you and us as, a, as, a, as an organization, can we go in the same direction unless we agree on that direction? And so that's the foundation for this series. And then there's 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. Verse 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? I can remember the first time, you don't mind if I tell you a quick story? I can remember the first time that this verse of scripture impacted my heart. I was in college and I decided to follow 
um, the call of God on my life. I, I went to school for architecture, but I knew I was called to be a pastor. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to finish up architecture, and then I'm going to go into the ministry. So, as, as, as you should, I went to sit down with my pastor, and I wanted to talk to him about three things. One, I wanted to acknowledge to him that I believe I was called to be a pastor. I wanted to get his advice about what Bible school or ministry school that I should go to. And the third thing I wanted to talk to him about was this girl that I was dating in college. And so, you know, we did good for the first two. And then I, I said, well, before I go, I want to talk to you about this girl that I'm dating. You know, I know that it's important for a pastor to have a good pastor's wife. And, you know, I'm, I'm really seriously interested in this girl. And so the first thing that he asked me was, is she born again? You would think. For a guy that wants to be in ministry, that's an easy question to answer. <laughs> but it wasn't so easy. I remember it kind of struck me different. He said, is she born again? The first thing I said, well, um, how many of y'all know we're in trouble? Yeah. I said, well, uh, she goes to the Episcopal Church. He said, open your Bible to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. I opened it. He read it. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteousness, etc., etc. He closed his Bible. He said, she is not for you. Now, I'm in love. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I mean, it got so bad in that session, he pushed the Kleenex box to me. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, obviously... He was saying that you want to be equally yoked together if you're considering marriage. And if you're not even sure whether this person is a Christian or not. But not only that, if you're not sure that she believes what you believe. Can I tell you a little bit more of this story? Since I'm out there. So I, 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 <laughs> I remember specifically leaving that session and going to the mall with my mom. And I was just broken hearted. He doesn't know me. And he, he didn't even give me a chance to tell him, you know, how wonderful she is. And, you know, mom, I, I, and, and, you know, my mom was trying to hear me. I mean, I put my hood on. I'm, at the, I'm just, a, you know, just a kid in college, you know, 19, 20 years old, broken hearted, you know. And so my mom said, well, if it's not meant to be, you know, you'll, you'll find out. But just, you know, leave it alone. I wish she had told me to pull the Band-Aid off quick. Because when I got back to school, I was different, but she was the same. I started a Bible study. And so forth and so on. One day I, I was dropping her off at work and I, I leaned over to give her a hug. And I noticed that she had a, 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 a hickey, a, a passion mark on her neck. And I, I said, what's that? And she said, what's what? I said, on your neck. And she said, oh, you know you did that. I was like, I don't even know how to give a, uh, at the time. I didn't even know how to give. A... Yeah, I grew up in a pastor's home, right? And she was like, oh, you did that. Man, I got to go to work. Oh, my gosh. I'm gonna, I, I found out she was an unbeliever. I didn't put that passion mark on her neck. Well, see, my life began to go closer and closer to God, and I guess that, you know, she wasn't in all that, and she ended up getting closer and closer to this other guy. It broke my heart. <laughs> I don't know why I started the sermon off on that, but the Bible says to don't be equally yoked together, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Amen? Amen. So we're in a series that we're calling What Kind of Church? are we. And so we're looking at who we are. So if you're a visitor, if you're thinking about making faith family or church home, you're in the right place. And then if you've been here, if you've been added to faith family over the last year, it's good for you to hear this and see this because the last time we even talked about this in the series was five years ago. It's important to know what we value as a church so that we can make sure we're in agreement. Amen? As we're going through this series, we want you to examine what kind of person are you? What do you hold in high esteem? What are your core values? This is a series about core values. Amen? So core values, as we said, are 
the fundamental beliefs of a person or organization. What's fundamental to you? Um, the next thing we want to note about that is that, you know, in life, if you're going to be in a serious relationship with someone, then you want to get to know who they are at their core. See, you know, trying to get somebody to change really isn't good. One of the things that Maya Angelou said, and I, I'm not quoting her like the Bible, but it, it's really a profound statement. When someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Stop believing what you want to believe about people. And when they reveal to you who they really are, believe them. And that's what we're doing. We're showing you, even though I may be ministering on a different subject next month or next, next, the next few months after that, you know, we may not get to certain topics, but when a person shows you who they really are, do what? Believe them. Amen. So we looked at three things. Number one, that we are a word church. Amen. Above all things, our number one core value is that we value the word. And we challenge you to be a word person above all the things. How many of you value your family? How many of you value your job? How many of you value, you know, extended family? A lot of things you can value of life. But I challenge you to be a word person. See, when you get the word, the word will help you keep your job. The word will help you keep your family. Come on. If you value the word above all things, it'll, it'll set the course for your life. Another thing we value is that we, are a, we value faith. We are a faith church. The third thing is that we are a grace church. Then we learned last week that we're a praying church. Amen? And we're, we're a church that focuses on ministering to men while we minister to women and children. And we saw the importance of that. We encourage you to go back and look at that. Then we also value marriages. We are a marriage builders church. So let's get into number seven today. Number seven, eight, and nine. Number seven is we are a family church. So what we're saying to you by this is that we want to be your faith family, not your fake family. Amen? And the reason why we say that is because family is important. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14 and 15, verse 14 says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Say that with me, the whole family. You know, God is the Father of, of the whole family. Praise God. And he notes here that there's a family that's in heaven and the same family. There's a family in heaven and in earth. And it's one family. And God is the father of us all. Praise God. Amen. So we see that with God, family is important. And, and, and you know, if you could just look at our name, we're called Faith Family Church. And one of the reasons why is because we value Family, the idea, the institution of family is really important to us. And that's what we're showing you. Matter of fact, we say that when you become family with us, that we're family for life. No matter where you end up in the country or around the world, when you become family, you fa you're family for life. Amen. How many of y'all know that's real in your natural family? In your natural family, you can't really undo the DNA that connects you to the family that you were born in. Amen? You know, you can't pick your parents. And, and you can't undo that. I know you people try to take you to court and divorce your mom and your dad. You know more my mom. You, come on now. You know more my dad. You know, we're, we're no longer family. I know sometimes we stop connecting with family. But in reality, when you become family, you're what? Family for life. Now, in Romans chapter 4, the Bible expands this concept of God's family in verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. If you're like me and you grew up in church, in nursery school or in nursery or like my son calls it 
in faith church or in kids church, you sing songs like Father Abraham. I can remember growing up, Father Abraham, and I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right on, Father Abraham. Have many sons. That's the left arm. All right. So I messed that up. Okay. <laughs> Abraham, the Bible says, even though we're not born Jews as Christians, the Bible says in, in, in Galatians chapter 3, I can't spend a whole sermon on, on this one part, but the Bible says in Gal, uh, Galatians chapter 3 that if you belong to Christ, how many of you, you belong to Jesus Christ? He says, if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So even though I wasn't born a Jew, Abraham is my father, spiritually speaking. Amen. Because obviously my DNA runs back probably to, to, to deep Africa. I mean, with the complexion of my skin, surely I'm from middle Africa. Amen. Not from the Middle East, praise God. But in the spiritual sense, Abraham, because I belong to Christ, come on, how many of you belong to Christ? Then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Incidentally, that makes us brothers and sisters no matter the, the pigmentation of our skin. And I'm going somewhere with that. Abraham, the Bible says, is what? The father of us all. God chose Abraham, promised him that his seed would be blessed in all nations. And God has a family in the earth through Abraham. And he is father of us all. I can remember one of the greatest things that I will ever remember from my dad. He's preaching right now in Detroit, Michigan. Pastor in Salvation Temple Church. Hey, Dad, always, he's number one to watch this. And he'll share it five times on his five Facebook pages. <laughs> I mean, he's in his 70s, and he's got like three, four Facebook pages. <laughs> one of the greatest things my dad ever taught us as a family. And he, family is important to, to my father. His father told him, take care of your family. He passed that down to, to my, my sister and, and all my brothers. It doesn't matter whether you like your brothers and sisters or not. It doesn't matter if you like your mother and father or not. At the end of the day, family is important to God. And family should be important to you. How can two walk together except they be agreed? In John chapter 8 and verse 44, let's look at this. In verse 44, he says, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. He is a liar and the father of it. Notice it says here that you are of your father, the devil. He was talking to the Pharisees at that time, right? Now notice there must be Two families in the earth. Not everybody in the earth belongs to God. Amen. There are some people that belong to the devil. Matter of fact, Jesus told some of them in that day, your, your daddy is the devil. <laughs> Amen. And that's the truth. That in the earth today, there are really not a multitude of ethnic groups and multitude of nations. There are simply two families in the earth there's the family that belongs to God through Jesus and through being a Jew. They are one family belonging to God and then everybody else who's not saved belongs to the devil. And that makes the work of the church extremely important because we're bombarding the gates of hell to empty hell and fill heaven. That's why the Bible says you must be Born again. Why? Because when you were born, you were born into sin. And with that reality, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25. Verse 25, it says, But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or every house divided against itself will not stand. When Jesus said this, 
I believe with all my heart, Satan knows this. And from the beginning of time, when Adam and his wife were in the garden, when they fell, I believe Satan has been trying to divide families from the very beginning. Why? Because a house divided against itself will not stand. Even Satan's house divided against itself will not stand. God's house divided. Come on, y'all help me now. Divided against itself will not stand. How about this? Your house. Come on, how about this? Your family, if it ever becomes... Come on, y'all help me now. If it ever becomes divided against itself. So I don't allow Chicago Bears jerseys in my house. <laughs> this is not a house divided. We are for the Texans. <laughs> you see that every now and then where, you know, the husband and the wife. So a house divided, come on, y'all help me now, against itself. We see it from the very beginning. Cain killed his, come on, y'all help me now, because some of us are in situations right now where we're divided within our family. And I know bad things happen and, and, and things have separated, but it's important for it to first begin in you where you acknowledge family is important to me. We may, we, may, we may not be talking right now. We may not even like each other right now. But I can never change that you are my brother or you are my sister. Family is important. I'm going to love you till I die. That don't mean I need to invite you to Thanksgiving. <laughs> that, that, that don't mean I need to talk to you on the phone. But I'm going to love you. Come on. And I just want to share with you because family is important to us as, as a church. And, and, and we're just sharing that. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9, um, God asked Cain a question. The Lord said to Cain, Where, where's, where's Abel your brother? And he said, I, I, I don't know. And then he asked him, am I my brother's keeper? That's kind of being smart, Ellen. Yeah. At this moment, Cain's blood is dripped into the ground. Cain killed his own. And God came to him with this question, where's your brother? And I'm asking you today, where are your siblings? Don't be smart, Ellie. Like Cain, be like, what does that matter? Right? No. Um, okay, get my brain back. Okay. Um, where, where's, your, where's, your, where's your family? And again, I'm not saying that you have to be in relationship but there ought to be a love within you. Amen. There ought to be a prayer within you. Come on. Amen. And then the last thing he says, am I my brother's keeper? And the implied answer to that question is what? Yes. Amen. All right. So let's finish this up. In Proverbs 17, verse 17 says this. <clears throat> a friend loves at all times and a brother is what? Born for adversity. You know, I always thought that this was cool because, you know, in my family, you know, there's times I have gotten along very well with my brothers and, and sister, and then there's times like I can't stand them. Come on, right? And there's times that they can't stand me. And I used to think about this scripture. You know, like, man, I got some friends that I like better than you guys, right? And then the Bible says that a brother's born. I used to interpret this as, you know what? Y'all was born to cause me trouble, right? <laughs> How many of you ever thought that? Man, I was reading my chapter one day, and I looked at it in the New Living Translation, and verse 17 says, a friend is always loyal. How many of you got some friends that are just, they'll stick close to you? I mean, there are some friends that will stick closer to you than a brother, right? But the second half, a friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to do what? Help in the time of need. One of the things that my father taught us, was that it doesn't matter what happens between you all, if ever somebody is against you all, you all are together. If they pick on you, they done picked on both of you. I mean, we could be, in, we could be fighting, right? And somebody come in to fight us, well, all of a sudden, if you start whooping my brother, I don't care if I was fighting him. <laughs> come on, y'all help me now. If you start whooping on him, I'm going to start whooping on you. <laughs> so we are what family church and then number eight we're what we are a servant leaders church praise God 
Um, in Matthew chapter 20, so let's shift gears. So we want you to know that we are a fa family is important to us. In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 26, the Bible says, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your what? Servant. So I need to shift your mind. We're going to talk about another thing that's extremely important to Faith Family Church, and that is being a servant. We are a servant leader's church. Where do we get that? Jesus said in verse 26 that whoever desires to become great. Is there anybody in your life that you want to not just be just okay? Yeah, I like those just okay co the commercials. You ever seen the commercial where the doctor is coming in? He's like, hey, what's up, y'all? And he's like, oh, we, you all ready for this today? And he's like, um, oh, matter of fact, before the doctor came in, the, the wife asked the, the nurse, is the doctor any good? And the nurse said, well, he's just okay. So if I were to ask the question, how many of you all want to be just okay in life? I don't think anybody would raise their hand. And not only do we want to be good at what we do in life, how many of you really desire to be great? To be a great mom, a great dad, a, a great husband, or, or a great wife, right? Well, the Bible says whoever, and that means you, whoever desires to be what? Great then notice what has to happen. Before you achieve greatness in life, you first must become a servant. Amen. My question to you today is, are you a servant? Verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve. And to give His life, what? A ransom for many. My question to you is, have you come to faith family to be served? Now, over 33% of all of the members at faith family church serve on our dream team. That means there's about 66, 67% of us that come to faith family just to be served. Oh, it gets quiet. And I know I'm stepping on your toes. But I'm talking to you about something that we extremely value. We are a servant leader's church. And just like in a family, everyone has a part to play. In a church family, there is a role, there is a part for you to play. As a matter of fact, we say it this way, in order to experience a better life in every aspect, if your life is not doing well, if you don't like how your money is going, if you don't like how your marriage is going, if you don't like what's going on in your body, I'm challenging you, are you serving anywhere. Not just in the church. I mean, it's a great place to volunteer. But if all you do is self-serve. See, when you go to the, go to the job, you are self-serve. Right? Because you get paid for that. You're not there for volunteer. When you take... I, oh, the amens are going down. <laughs> right? When you take care of your kids, that's self-serve. Right? But when you volunteer outside of your job or outside of your home, and one of the greatest places for you to volunteer is in your church. Because your church is giving its life as a ransom for many. See, when you serve in the body of Christ, the goal is to get people saved. The goal is to fill God's house. I don't care if you're working in the nursery or on the hospitality team or in the live production. You could be picking up signs in the parking lot. But when anybody gets saved, you are a part of that salvation. You are doing what Jesus did as an example when he, the king of kings and lord of lords, the one who was and is to come, when he showed up on the planet, he wasn't self-serve. He didn't come and like bow down before me and kiss my ring and what can you do for me lately? Come on, man. He took, he, he stripped himself of all splendor, put a robe on, put a, put a towel on and washed his disciples' feet. And he told them, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. So I challenge you. We are a servant. That's why if you've ever seen me carry a tote or plug a wire or turn something on or pick something up, 
I don't know if you noticed, we got like 10 assistant pastors in this church. We got two executive pastors. We got eight assistant pastors. And you may not be able to tell because that faith family, there are no big eyes and little, little U's. And if you're looking for a high profile pastor that gets his nails manicured, come on, and gets a pedicure, come on. And he's got about three or four people that walk along with him. I'm messing with you. If you're that kind of plastic, God bless you. We thank you for the anointing that's on your life. Right? I'm okay with that, right? Now, now don't get me wrong. There's a place for the man or the woman of God being so focused on the word that they don't miss it to the right or to the left. Matter of fact, Paul told them this. uh, Not Paul. Peter told him in Acts chapter 6, it's not even reasonable for us to be passing out food We need to give ourselves continually to prayer. Come on, man, I got a big job. There are hundreds of you that I need to be praying for every week. I'd rather be praying for you than plugging up wires. Come on, I'd rather for the message to be anointed than for the sound and the lights to be right. Amen? So don't get me wrong, there's a place for that. But in the core of our heart, we don't mind carrying a bag. We don't mind lifting a box. Why? Because from the least of us to the greatest of us, we are a servant leader's church. So did you come to be served or to serve? Your service in the church has eternal consequences. God wants to do something special with Faith Family Church because we are a word church. And his word is the seed that changes lives. So when this ministry is expanded, lives, let me put it to you like this. There are thousands upon tens of thousands of people in our community whose eternal life hangs in the balance right now. See, you're in church or you're listening right now, but there are tens of thousands of people right here that aren't in church. They don't know God. And if they were to die today, they'd bust hell wide open. And there's no, um, there, there's no end of hell. It's eternal. There, there's no, okay, I learned my lesson. You were right. There is a heaven and there's, you know. No, once you die without Jesus, you go to hell. See, listen to this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. It, it's eternal. He said, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold or uh, precious stones or wood or hay or straw, can I tell y'all the story of um, the three little pigs? (laughs) He's talking about stones and wood and straw. There were three little pigs. One built his house out of stone. Y'all help me now. Y'all pray for me, right? I've been plugging in too many wires. So one built his house out of stone, right? One built his house out of wood, right? And the other one wanted it quick because he wanted to play, right? And he built his lot, built his house out of straw. And then the big bad wolf came along. I don't know if they got that story from this verse. And he huffed and he puffed and he blew that little straw house away. And then he went to the one with wood. It took a little more time. They went to school, right? (laughs) Come on. They got a degree, right? But they didn't build their life on the word of God. And when the enemy came to huff and puff and blow, see, God is saying in this verse, take heed what you build your life on. Because it matters. All right, next verse. Verse 13 says, each one's work, what you do in life really matters. And it'll become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a what? Reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as though through what? <coughs> as through fire. So notice this. Your service in life, what you do in life, uh, uh, there was the old song, uh, only what you do for Christ will last. Yeah, you, 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 you're you doing everything for your family, and that's good. You, you're putting up a good nest egg for your retirement. That's great. 
But what's going to happen when you stand before the master? And he asks you to give an account for what you did in this life. And you say, I got my doctor's degree. People say, all right, that's good. But what does that matter now in eternity? Only, ah, let me give you another verse. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25 says, for whoever desires to save his life will what? Lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will what? Find it. And when he refers to losing your life, he's not talking about you dying, but giving up stuff that you want. The, the, the other way to say this is when you take care of God's house, He will. Come on, man. He will take care of your house. See, when, when you're trying to take care of your house first, then you're left to your own ability. But when you say, God, I love you and you mean everything to me, I want to help you do what you do, all of a sudden, He'll help you and take care of what you need to have done. When you do it for my sake or the gospel's sake. Verse 26 says, for what, profit is, uh, for what profit is it for a man to, if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man receive or give in exchange for it as, his own soul? What are you pursuing in life? At the end of life, what will it matter? If you've made no eternal difference, did you make a difference at all? When you can live your life to make a difference in someone else's life. I believe there ought to be hundreds of people that you'll meet in heaven. And they'll, so th they'll say, thank you, Luanda. I am born again because of your care ministry at Faith Family Church. You didn't know it, but when you took a plant to the house, I was just a child. I lost my father, but I remembered you being there, giving me the love of God. And I desired to be like you. I gave my life to Jesus. And I'm not the same since. Come on. For the Son of Man will come in His glory and of His Father and with the angels and then He will reward each one according to His works. One day you'll have to stand before God and He's going to say, all right, what happened in life? What did you do with the life I gave you? With the education I allowed you to have? He's going to reward you according to the works. And 2 Peter 3, and the last point on this, is but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away and there will be a great noise. And the elements will, will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The works that he's referring to are the works of men. Have you come to Christ to be served. Jesus said, I didn't come to you to be served. If you're born again, you should be volunteering somewhere. The church is a great place, but not the only place. But you should be serving your community. Serve Christ. Amen. Amen. I believe I drove that point home. And then last, um, we're not only a family church, a servant leader's church, but we are last but not least, a spirit-for-led church. Say that with me. A spirit-for-led church. No, no. You, come on. Say it with me. A spirit-for-led church. Oh, y'all are not getting it. Let me give you an example. Say it out loud. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Come on, one more time. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Amen. So when you talk about what kind of church are we, we are a spirit-filled church. Do you all know what I mean by that? We're a Holy Ghost church, right? But we're also a spirit-led church, and that's why we say we are a spirit-led church. <laughs> so one last time before we go, I want you to shift your brain. I want you to shift your brain. We are a family church. That's very important to us. Serving is very important to us. But also one of the things that we value is 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we value being baptized with the Holy Ghost. So let's talk about that for a moment. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 4, <clears throat> Jesus assembled his disciples together. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. How many of you all know the last thing you say to somebody before you die could be considered the most important? I got one amen on the front. I'll say this again. This is Acts chapter 1. Jesus is about to ascend unto the Father and sit, right, sit down on the right hand of the throne. This is literally the last things that he said before he left. It's probably the greatest reminder. One of the things that Jesus valued for those that follow him. How many of you all are followers of Jesus? Then this is one of the most important things that he has to say to you. He said to them, wait for the promise which he said, you have heard of me. Verse 5, he said, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, what? Not many days from now. How many of you have been baptized in water? And if you have not been, we'll have baptism service in a couple of months. And we encourage you, if you're born again, be baptized in water. It's not it's not, a, uh, it's, it's not a, a choice, it's a command. It's something that you're commanded to do. But he said, John truly baptized people with water, but you are about to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, if baptism is the same to both, then the same way you were immersed into water, Jesus wants to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are several denominations in the body of Christ, like the Pentecostals. They, they believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We also, we're not a Pentecostal denomination, but we are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are charismatic churches. They are spirit-filled churches. They, in other words, believe in the person, work, and power of the Holy Spirit. We are a charismatic church, not necessarily a denomination, but we, we believe in the person of the Holy Spirit and His work in our lives. Amen? Well, it comes from Acts chapter 1. Jesus told them, wait, in a few days, you're about to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In 10 days, 10 days later, they were in prayer, in a prayer service, and all of a sudden, there appeared unto them tongues like clothing, uh, 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 tongues that appeared like as fire, and it sat on each of them, and they all began to speak. Look at verse 4. In Acts chapter 2, being assembled together, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them what? Utterance. Now watch this. A lot of confusion is in the body of Christ about the Holy Spirit. I've taught two major series just last year on the subject. So if you're new here, I encourage you, because this is important to us, we may not talk about the Holy Spirit. You may not even know that I am a tongue-talking believer. I speak in tongues. That's one of the number one ways I can pray for you. Yeah. Amen. And it may be months, you may never hear me pray in tongues or speak in tongues, right? Um, unless the Spirit of God moves and I give a diverse kind of tongue and interpretation of tongues, we know that the, the number one purpose of tongues, not the only purpose, but the number one purpose of tongues is in your prayer life. But even in this Spirit-led church, the majority of us don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The majority of us here today don't speak with other tongues. Ooh, it's getting quiet in this church. <laughs> now what I'm saying is, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? We are revealing to you something that we value extreme. Go back, please. We're revealing to you something that we value that is extreme. Amen? Extremely important. Now listen, this is a disclaimer. You do not have to speak with tongues in order to go to heaven. 
Come on, put your hands together for that one. Amen. How about this? You do not have to speak with tongues in order to be a member of Faith Family Church. But if you want to see, receive power to live right, power to walk right, power to talk right, how about this? Power to do right. Then consider being baptized with the Holy Spirit and receiving to be uh, consider being a spirit led church. So now notice he says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say filled with the Holy Spirit. So the, the New Testament church were filled with spirit filled believers. How many of y'all like refills? I like refills. Now, I'm not drinking sweet tea, but sweet tea is like one of my favorite drinks. And sometimes I'll go to a really nice restaurant, and especially if they have sweet tea. Um, if it's really nice, sometimes I have to ask, do the refills come free? <laughs> Y'all can call me frugal or whatever, but I'm not just going to be drinking down a whole lot of tea and have to pay the extra cost. So how many of y'all like refills? And one of the things you'll find with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that there's one initial filling. How many of y'all know if you can fill something, you can empty it? And in the same way, the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen, if you use Holy Spirit power in life to do right, then you need to have times where you refill yourself with the Holy Spirit. Come on. I know these are big and large concepts, but I'm, I'm telling you, we're very, very passionate about it. So let me hurry up because we can get into a series on that. I did two series. One is called God Power, and the other one is called, no, go back for me, Ask, Receive, and Speak. Okay? So the first thing was they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and then the second thing, you see that they speak with what? Other tongues. Now, when you get born again, you have the Holy Spirit, but when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, the, the proof or the, the, the evidence of the baptism is that you'll start speaking in tongues. Amen? If you need more about that, then watch one of these other two series. Praise God. Then in Ephesians chapter 5, as I get ready to close, verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine, he didn't say you couldn't drink it. Now, let me clarify that. Because there's two groups in the body of Christ. There, <laughs> there, there, there are those that don't drink at all. And then there's some sipping saints. <laughs> now because we don't highly value alcohol, I'm not going to do a whole point on this. I'm going to just say this. If you believe that it's okay to drink, or if you drink as a believer, then do me one favor. Buy a breathalyzer. They sell them at Costco. And then don't go past the state limit at whatever state you're in. Because God said, be not drunk with wine. Whether you say it's drunk or not, the legal limit is drunk. Why is it quiet in this section over here? <laughs> so, so if you're going to be a word person, well, you know, the Bible say you, that doesn't say you can't drink. Well, it does say don't be, somebody say move on past. <laughs> I got you. The second half of this verse, he said don't be drunk with wine where is, is dissipation, but he said do be what? Filled with the what? spirit. Now the same way you're filled with wine. When you get filled with wine, you're drunk. And when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, come on somebody. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. So I want to just simply show you that the Bible encourages you to be a spirit-filled believer. Amen. We're a spiritful led church. I close with Romans 8 and 14. Verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. I don't believe that you can be 
led by the Spirit if you're not filled with the Spirit. And this pre puts up high order because he says those that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. I don't know about you. I, I want to be a son of God. I am a son of God. Well, I need to be led by the Spirit. Amen? So three things, that three more things that we highly value, highly esteem. Is one, family is important. Two, well, eight, seven, eight, nine. We're servants. Three, we're spirit-filled. We're spirit-led. I believe the Spirit of God has touched you already. One aspect or another. That's who we are as a church. But who are you as a person? Are you a family person? Are you a serving servant? Are you spirit-led? I just feel one tug in my heart. I remember a long time ago I watched this. And this is about being a family person. Family is important. I watched a little video clip of a lion, uh, of a of a, wa uh, a water buffalo that was attacked by lions. There were some lions that were lurking, and there was a herd of buffalo that were headed that way. Somebody caught it all on video, and sure enough, as the lion approached, the herd began to run. And sure enough, one of the baby water buffaloes got caught. Satan wants to separate you from your faith family. He really does. So he can attack you and destroy your life. Don't let that happen. Stay with the herd. Stay with the family. Amen? What's very interesting, this is a phenomenal thing. You can, you can uh, Google it. It's the Battle of Kruger. It's a lion, a crocodile, and a water buffalo. So they, the lion, six, like female lions or five, they grab the little water buffalo and fall into the water. And they're trying to pull this little baby water buffalo out. All of a sudden, a crocodile grabs the back of that little water buffalo. And I see that. And I see that as a pastor. The enemy comes in to grab one of you from the flock and he's pulling at you from your job, pulling at you from your marriage, just really trying to rip you apart. Let me just show you how powerful family is. The herd of buffalo came back toward the crocodile lost the battle. So the lion now have it on the shore and, and, and they're holding this and, and, but the herd is on them kind of charging. The next thing you know, one brave buffalo hooks a lion and throws him up in the air runs that one off and then all of a sudden you can see it and it was a, a, a very poor video but you can see that the little baby buffalo stood up still alive even though they're latched on and had just enough strength to get into the herd and then now the lions are just crouched, and the buffalo ran the lot five lot ran them off. Now that doesn't always happen that way, but it shows you the power of family. I want you to bow your head right now, and I want to ask you a question, not about your natural family, but about your spiritual family. Do you have a faith family? We want to be your spiritual family. We want to be that herd of water buffalo, as it were, that when you're attacked in life, that we can surround you. We can throw off the enemies and the demons that try to latch onto you, to pull you into destruction. I pray that God will put in your heart where to become and where to belong. Let me pray this prayer for you. And congregation, please pray this out loud. If you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus, if you mean this from your heart, He'll save you right where you are. Let's pray. Say this out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today to make you my Lord. I do believe that Jesus Christ...